everyone, I want to welcome you all here tonight. Uh, it's going to be a great evening. Not only are we going to be in the Word of God, but I definitely spill, feel the Holy Spirit here tonight with us. So that's a great thing. We want to welcome all those that are watching online, and we, we thank them for watching. And also, so many of them share the, uh, the video to others and to their friends. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to come alongside you tonight. And Lord, we open up your word. And as we study it, Lord, I pray, Lord, that it will just touch each and every one of our hearts. Lord, we just ask for a special blessing upon this place tonight. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. So last week, we concluded our series on the Sabbath day healings by Jesus. So tonight, we're going to begin a brand new series. And that series is going to take place in the Old Testament. We're going to be talking about judges, judges from the Old Testament. The judge's responsibility was to be the leader of the people, uh, both as military judges and also as their civil leaders. Now, there were about 15 judges altogether. 13 are mentioned in the book of Judges, counting Barak, who was also a, a co-judge alongside Deborah. And there was two judges that are mentioned over in 1 Samuel. So a total of 15. Let's take a minute and talk about something that we all know is true. And what that is, is real. And I do mean real heroes are hard to find these days. Would you not agree? Yeah. Exactly. They are. And I say this because, you know, the music and the movie and the sports industries, it produces a steady stream of stars each and every year that skyrocket to the top of the charts. And then all of a sudden they seem to just kind of fade away. They fade away from the limelight. And usually after they start fading away, we don't hear anything about them until after they die. So, you know, Patsy and I watch a TV show on Reels TV uh, called Autopsy, The Last Hours. And it usually has an autopsy of someone that at one time was pretty well known, famous. And what amazes me with that show is this, that in just about every case, the person that has died had some type of an addiction or some type of sin that contributed heavily to their death. Well, let me tell you, the book of Judges is about heroes. 13 men and women who delivered Israel from its oppressors. And of course, these judges are just like the TV show that I just mentioned. Uh, they're, they're not perfect. In fact, they include an assassin, a sexually promiscuous man, a person who broke all the laws of hospitality. However, they were one thing, and they were obedient to God. And God used each and every one of them in a mighty way for his honor and his glory. The book of Judges is also about sin. We ought to know a lot about it. We're all sinners, amen? amen? And it's consequences. It's like an open sore that gets infected and left untreated, sin grows, and then soon poisons the entire body. We know that. The book of Joshua ends with the nation taking a very strong stand for God. Um, it was ready to experience all the blessings of the promised land. However, the Israelites lost their spiritual commitment and their motivation. So let me start off here with a little background of the subject matter of tonight's message. The children of Israel have turned their backs on God, who has blessed them in a mighty way. They've turned against him. Uh, you see, they also, what they had done is they turned towards idols. So God allowed the, Men the Mennonites to come against them what they were doing where they were burning their fields, they were stealing their animals, they were enslaving their women. You know, and it's, it's like what we've always talked about here is, yes, God will chasten you, but when we refuse to flee from the temptation or we refuse to take that detour or the escape route that God gives us, God will allow us to be knuckleheads. He will. He will. And because of this, the children of Israel hid in caves, and they lived in constant fear of these fierce and powerful and many peoples. So take your Bible, open it to Judges chapter 6. I've titled tonight's message, The Farmer with Weak and Wavering Faith. 
Judges chapter 6 uh, is going to be talking about my favorite judge, by the way, Gideon. Gideon. So, chapter 6, verse 11. We're going to take a look at the first two verses, 11 and 12. So, here we go. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the Tebereth tree, which was Ophrah, which belonged to Joash in Aberizite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Mennonites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Okay, here we find God has raised up a man named Gideon, and God spoke to Gideon through an angel. I noticed a few things in those two verses. The very first thing I noticed was that uh, Gideon was threshing wheat, and he was using a wine press that was hidden out of sight. Now, for those of you who don't know, threshing is a process of separating the grains of wheat from the use, useless outer shell called chaff. Now, this was usually done in a very large open area, often on top of a hill to where the, a breeze, a wind could be blowing. The reason being is what they would do is they would toss the chaff up and it would blow away and separate uh, the wheat from it and the wheat into the air. However, if Gideon had been using something like that and been up on a hilltop with that wind blowing in a usual spot, he would have been an easy target for the Mennonites because they would raid what he was doing. They're raiding the land. Uh, they're pilfering anything of value. They were just stealing it, coming and just stealing it. They were overwhelming. They were large. It was strong numbers. They were fighters. The second thing I noticed is the angel assured Gideon, saying that the Lord is with you. The Old Testament records several appearances of the angel of the Lord. We see it, we'll see it again. And most scholars believe that this angel of the Lord was a special appearance of Jesus Christ uh, prior to his mission on earth. Others believe that this angel was a special messenger from God. Now we're going to see in verses 14 and 16, we're going to find the Lord is having a conversation with Gideon. So has the Lord joined in on the conversation with Gideon and the angel? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. In either case, what is really important here is the angel, no matter who it is, had authority from God to speak and had a very special message for Gideon. That's what's important. Thirdly, the angel called Gideon, you mighty man of valor. Wow. Can you imagine the angel of the Lord coming to you and calling you a mighty man of valor? Notice here that the first thing that God doesn't do, he doesn't bow greet uh, Gideon for hiding as he worked. No, not at all. He encourages, he builds him up. He gives him the title of a mighty man of valor. And I believe that angel was saying to Gideon, you may appear to be cowardly today, but you are going to do something in your life and you're going to become a mighty man of valor. So really here, the bottom line is this. The angel was looking at Gideon, not as he was, but as he could be when the power of God was in his life. Can I tell you this? The very same thing is true with you and I. All we have to do is allow the power of God into our lives. And we can, we can have the very same thing. As someone once said, nothing about our lives are trivial when God himself looks on it. And no activity is too mundane for God to observe. And I believe that. I truly do. I believe that it, with God in our life, nothing is trivial. It doesn't matter how, what we think about it at all. God is in charge of it. Did you notice, though, how Gideon bypassed that entire statement of you mighty men of valor? And Gideon's first response was, the Lord was with me. And what was he most interested in? Well, we're going to see in verses 13 and 14, he's most interested in complaining. Complaining. Take a look at it. In verses 13 and 14, follow along. Gideon said to him, oh, my Lord. If the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all of his miracles? 
which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Mennonites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Mennonites. Have I not sent you? Well, you see, all of Gideon's life, he had heard about the miraculous works of God in delivering the Israelites from uh, uh, the Egyptian slavery uh, del and, and through the wilderness wanderings. Remember, they wandered around 40 years. Uh, not to mention, it had been almost 250 years since the 10 plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, and 200 years since the last great miracle of the parting of the Jordan River. So because of the lack of miracles upon going on here, the lack of them, Gideon wrongly assumes that God has given up on his people. However, it wasn't God that had given up. It was the people who had given up on God. And that happens. That happens. It was that. And they knew exactly what God expected of them. They had his laws, but they chose not to obey him. Any of that sound familiar to any of you, or is it just me up here? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And just as today, God's blessings, as Moses and Joshua had foretold, came only when the people were obedient to God. God blesses people who are obedient. When you're not obedient, he kind of lets you just go ahead and be a knucklehead. Now, in verse 14, the Lord turns the tables on Gideon. How? Well, by issuing a challenge to go himself and save the people from their oppression. And if Gideon would accept that challenge, the Lord promised to strengthen and empower him. In verses 15 and 16, we find Gideon's second response to the Lord was really just nothing more than an excuse, basically just kind of arguing against serving God. Take a look at verses 15 and 16. 15 says this, so he said to him, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Man Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Mennonites as one man. Okay. Now, can you just imagine Gideon talking with the Lord, the angel of the Lord, He's probably got a shaky voice. Uh, he's probably stuttering a little bit. And he says to God, how can I save the people? Now, granted, that's a pretty tall order. But Gideon saw himself as too weak to do it, too incompetent to do it, and inadequate for such an enormous job. And it is an enormous job that the angel of the Lord is asking to do. And to top it off now, Gideon brings his entire family into the mix. He's going to air a little dirty laundry. He says that my clan is the weakest here in Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. This guy's got absolutely no self-esteem at all. He is so low, he's, you know, he, he can't fall any farther. You can't fall off a floor. However, the Lord would not accept Gideon's excuse, not at all. So the Lord gave a straightforward answer to Gideon that ended all the excuses and all the arguments. The Lord said to Gideon, surely I will be with you. Now that's a pretty strong promise. Surely I will be with you. Now here God was promising to give him the strength that he needed to overcome the opposition that he was about to face. I know that we all probably want to beat up on Gideon as we sit here, all safe and sound. God in our heart, just so blessed. But I mean, think about it. You know, let's not beat up on, on Gideon too badly. Because at times, are we not just like him? I hazard to say we have been. We're called to serve God in some specific way. God promises us the tools and the strength we need. And what do we do? We make excuses. You know, think of some of the excuses you may have used. I got to pray about that first. Six months later, you're still praying about it. Let me tell you how crazy it is to remind God of our limitations. 
Because when we do that, all that's doing, it it's implies that God doesn't even know anything about us. Can I tell you, he knows everything about us. Everything. Remember, every hair on our head is counted. He knows the number. So really what we need to do is this. Our lesson is let's not spend as much time making excuses. Let's instead spend time in doing what God wants us to do. In verse 17, we find the third response from Gideon to the Lord. It was a request for a sign to prove that he was really getting a call from the Lord. Now, I believe that uh, we need to cut Gideon a little more slack here. Most likely, this was a legitimate request by Gideon. He had to make sure that it was, uh, what he was hearing was definitely the Lord who was calling him. I say this because of this. Think about it. Who would Gideon go to for advice? Remember, they're all turned their, they've turned their back. Everybody in his family has turned their back. We're going to see that a little bit later on. There's really nobody worshiping God. Who's he going to go to and say, hey, man, brother, can you pray for me? Uh, sister, what, what, do you, what about this? What do you think about this? Brother, what about this? What about that? How is he going to get? How is he going to receive advice, prayer, confirmation, and what the Lord has really asked him to do? Really from nobody. In verses 18 and 19, we find Gideon requesting the Lord to wait until he could prepare an offering for him. And the Lord says, I'll wait for you until you come back. Now, can you just imagine asking the Lord to wait? I mean, that's a pretty gutsy move, isn't it? But you know what he does? He does. So Gideon runs home. He prepares a young goat and bread without yeast. And he runs back to the Lord and he offers it to him under the tree. Now, just imagine. Here's this guy now. I mean, he's asked the Lord to wait on him. He, he's not, you know, he's not doing the slow walk. You know, he's hurrying it up. He's got a little jump in his step. He's running. He's running with this meat and bread and that broth, and he doesn't want to spill it all. Of course not. And he's wanting to hustle back. And then in verses 20 and 21, we see the angel of the Lord tells Gideon to place the meat and the bread on a particular rock and then pour the broth on top of it. And then the angel of the Lord put the end of his staff, touching the meat and the bread, and the fire came from the rock, consumed the meat and the bread. Wow, gone, it's consumed. Uh, you see, by consuming the meat and the bread, it was a sign that the Lord had not only accepted the offering, but he had also accepted the giver. And that would have been Gideon. And then suddenly, the Lord left his sight. In verses 23 and 24, we see the Lord giving a strong assurance to Gideon. His voice obviously spoke from the sky, proclaiming the message, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. Another promise. And now that Gideon is encountered with this angel of the Lord is over. He builds an altar as a memorial to mark the experience and the call of God. And he calls it, the Lord is peace. The Lord is peace. And then as we go into verses 25 and 26, we find the Lord wasting no time at all testing Gideon's commitment. That very night, it says, that very night, God returns to Gideon and gives him a very difficult assignment. God tells Gideon to offer a burnt sacrifice to demonstrate a renewed rec uh, reconciliation and a recommitment to God. So just what was that assignment? He told him to take his father's young bull and tear down the altar of Baal that the father had along with the wooden image that was beside it. That was what they were all worshiping at that time. They had turned their backs on the Lord and they were worshiping at the altar of Baal and a wooden image that was beside it. Now, Gideon was expecting severe consequence by doing that. After all, the entire city, all of his family are all worshiping at this altar. The severe consequence are probably even worse. Even maybe a mob of violence against him for destroying this false worship center of his father and all of his neighbors. However, Gideon being obedient to the Lord, it showed his strong courage and his dedication to the Lord because of his faith and his belief. In verse 27, we see that Gideon, he takes 10 of his men that were his servants, probably workers of the field. 
in the night, and he did as the Lord told him to do. Now we all can guess exactly what happened. It was just as Gideon expected. Verses 29 and 30 tell us that when his father and the neighbors woke up that next morning, got up, went outside, and they saw the false worship center all destroyed, and immediately the leaders of the city form a committee to investigate this criminal and shocking destruction. And apparently, one of the ten servants of uh, Gideon copped a plea and snitched off Gideon as the head of the destruction crew. And in verse 30, we find that the sentence of this offense came very quickly, swiftly. They demanded that Gideon be executed for the criminal act that he had committed. That's a pretty tough sentence. That's how much they worshipped and thought of this worship of Baal and this wooden image. In verses 31 and 32, we see Gideon's father, Joash, come to the defense of his son. Apparently, God had touched his heart of what Gideon had done, or maybe to some degree he recognized the hand of God was upon Gideon. But all that mattered to Joash was saving his son from the death sentence. And he offered the death squad three arguments in defense of Gideon. In verse 33, we finally find the crisis for which Gideon has been called to do. The enemy, the fierce Mennonite army of 135,000 made its annual invasion into Israel. Now just imagine the sight of 135,000 camel riding soldiers that have swept across the plains into the valley of Zezreel to set up camp. I mean, think about it. That's huge. And everything that went along with them. It's huge. In verses 34 and 35, it says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. Now get this. Literally, in the Hebrew, it's saying that the Spirit of Jehovah clothed Gideon. Clothed him. Then it tells us that Gideon blew his first trumpet in his hometown, and the men rallied behind him. In other words, he's gathering an army. And once his hometown had responded, Gideon sounded the trumpet throughout Manasseh and the other northern tribes of Asher and Zubalim and Naphtali. And now here comes the good news. In chapter 7, verse 3, we're told a total of 32,000 Israelite soldiers mobilized for war behind the man of God, Gideon. So let's jump over to chapter 7. Let's take a look from verses 2 through 8. Follow along as I read those. Chapter 7, starting with verse 2, it says this, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Mennonites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid... Let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, This one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, This one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, Everyone who laps up the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, and the number of those who lapped up putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. And then the Lord said to Gideon, By the 300 men who lapped up, I will save you, and delivered the Midianites into your hand, let all the other people go, every man to his place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands and sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in a valley. Wow. He had 32,000. That's what he started with. So here we find 
that Gideon is being tested by God. Well, after all, it only stands a reason since Gideon, remember, uh, we didn't talk about it, but in the previous verses, Gideon tested God over in chapter 6, verses, verses 37 through 40 uh, about two fleece tests. Remember those? Two fleece tests. Now here comes some bad news. In verse 2 of chapter 7, we find the first test of Gideon's faith. God commanded Gideon to reduce his army. Now, now think about this. 32,000 is all the men that he was able to raise. That's all that came and volunteered to this volunteer army. They already know they're outnumbered to 135,000. And God said, whoop, that got too many. Got too many. So we can ask the question, why on earth does God want, us to, want Gideon to reduce the size of his army that he's called together? He really doesn't have enough men. And the answer is this. God wanted the army reduced to prevent any boasting of Gideon and or his soldiers. God wanted to teach without any doubt that it was him and him alone who could give the victory and conquer the enemy of his people. You see, the battle had to be won by an act of God through a miracle. Because we all know that when soldiers win a battle, the credit often, often goes to them without any regard to God's presence or his sovereignty. However, when victory is due to a clear miracle, the glory always goes to God and to God alone. So here comes some bad, more, more bad news. In verse 3, we find the next command from the Lord, which was surely to be a huge surprise to Gideon. Why? Especially he was outnumbered. He's outnumbered over 4 to 1 already. And now the Lord tells Gideon to send home any soldier who is fearful and afraid. Why would he do that? Because God wanted soldiers of faith. He wanted soldiers that believed and trusted. He wanted soldiers that had the courage that would stand and fight with all their strength. And guess what? 22,000 soldiers got up and left, leaving 10,000. Leaving 10,000 now to face the strongest and the most ferocious army around. But wait, but God's not done. He's not done with Gideon's faith. God is about to give Gideon a heart attack by reducing his army even more. For the second reduction, the Lord told Gideon to have the soldiers gather at the water's edge to refresh themselves. In other words, let them drink some water. Then the Lord told Gideon to separate those soldiers who cupped the water in their hands and those that got down on their knees and lapped the water up like a dog and from those who knelt to drink their mouths in the stream. So why was this method of drinking water? What was this to do? Why that test? Well, Soldiers that cupped their water in their hands showed that they'd be more alert staying on their feet. Instead of getting on their hands and knees and putting their whole head down into the water, couldn't see anything. But soldiers that knelt down, cupped the hand and brought the water to them could still see the horizon. And those soldiers that knelt down and drank with their mouths are showing less alertness than those that didn't. And then verse 6 gives us and getting the grim details. Only, thir- only 300 soldiers drank by cupping water in their hands. 300. But in verse 7, the Lord gives Gideon so- a wonderful promise. He assures Gideon that they would be victorious with the 300 soldiers, that God promised to save them and to defeat the enemy. Uh, verse 8 tells us that, that, being, that being obedient to the Lord, Gideon sends 9,700 soldiers home. Just think 300 soldiers are left to do battle with three, 135,000 trained, fierce soldiers. Now the odds go from a little over 4 to 1. Now it's 450 to 1. Not good odds. Not good odds. So what faith Gideon had? Gideon's faith is just a short time, has grown from a very weak faith. Remember, he was the weakest one of his family. He did his best to talk God out of it, but no, God wasn't hearing any part of it. So he goes from a very weak faith in a very short time, and now he's grown his faith to an outstanding, outstanding faith. Gideon's faith of stock absolutely skyrockets here. And this is a faith that God wants us to have in him. A strong faith. 
an absolute faith and trust, a believing in the impossible. Because remember, God says there's nothing impossible with God. And refusing to be moved by any doubt or any question. In other words, he tells you to do something, just do it. Don't worry about it. He's got it handled. Now, I can't help but think of uh, over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, the writer says this, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. Him is God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's what we need to do. We need to please God. Then we're rewarded. And we got to di diligently seek him. In verse 9, we find that God comes to Gideon the very same night, saying, Arise and go down to the camp, for I have delivered you into the hand. In other words, the battle is really already won. won. All you got to do is just go do it. The angel of the Lord told Joshua the very same thing. Uh, so Gideon, he, he wasn't really ready to just get up and run down there. What he does is he sends some spies down to the Mennonite camp. And in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7, we, we learn uh, from the spy that an enemy soldier dreamed of a loaf of barley bread tumbling into the camp. Now you have to realize here that barley bread was really considered inferior. Kind of like Gideon's army. Pretty inferior. 450 to 1. And this soldier told his companion of this dream, and both soldiers interpreted the dream as meaning their defeat by Gideon. They had They'd already got beat and they hadn't even got out of a tent. You see, they saw the bread as Gideon's small army that was coming to strike and destroy the, the massive army of the Mennonites. And in verse 15, we, we find this. Gideon heard the telling of this dream. The spies came back. He told them. And he said to the camp of Israel, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of the Midian into our hands. So in other words, he's just repeating what God had told him. Guys, we've got this hand. We've got this one. They're already shaking down there in their boots. All we've got to do is go down there and take it. In verse 16, we find Gideon dividing his army into three different companies. So what are they supposed to use for weapons? Well, they don't have planes. They don't have tanks. There's no long-range missiles, no guns. What does Gideon do? He gives his men a trumpet and an empty pitcher with a torch inside each one. In other words, it's kind of like a lantern. In verse 17, Gideon then tells his men this, watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, do as I do. In other words, the three divisions were to watch Gideon. Gideon's in the lead. Do as I do. Do as I do, he says. And what are they to do? Verse 20 tells us. Uh, they're to blow their trumpets, break their pitchers, holding their torches in their left hands and trumpets in their right, and cried out the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Wow. That's it. I think of the words of God spoke the world into existence. The words of Gideon is going to chase the Mennonites out of camp. In verse 21, it says this, every man in his place all around the camp, they we're talking about the Mennonite camp here, and the whole Mennonite army ran and cried out and fled to Beth Acacia. In other words, Gideon's warriors simply watched the army of the, of, of the Medians fall. They fell into panic, confusion, disorder, and they retreated. In other words, now it's the Mennonite's army fleeing to the hills and the caves to hide. Not one man of Gideon's army needed to draw a sword, not one, to defeat the enemy, not one. Uh, Gideon's small army could have never brought such a victory on its own strength, could never have done it. But God wanted to demonstrate to them and us today, by the way, that's why we have this Bible, that's why we call it our workbook. He wanted to demonstrate to them and us today that victory depends not on strength or numbers, but obedience and commitment to him. And that is true. If we are committed to God and we are obedient to him, we can count on his strength to pull us through. Amen. Amen. You know, most of us want to know God's plan for our lives. The problem is we're not always sure how to find it. I don't know how many times I've asked, Harry, I, I don't know my gift in life. Well, if you don't know it, I don't know it either. <laughs> I may think I know it from some of your actions maybe. But I don't. 
God's given you that gift. You know, a lot of times what we want, what we want to do is just wait and hope God's plan will just come out of the blue. I think we've all probably done that. <laughs> Procrastinated. However, what happens is when we do that, we run the risk of ruining whatever we're doing now because we're waiting on something else. So let's do nothing. How many times has that happened? Doing nothing. And as we saw with Gideon's, he had limited vision. However, he was committed to doing it. He didn't know how God was going to plan all this out. He didn't know how it was going to work out, except he knew that he was going to win, but he didn't know how it was going to happen. But he trusted and he believed in the Lord. And yes, Gideon had weak moments. And he had failures. Just like you and I, we have weak moments. And we have failures. But he was still a faithful servant to God. During our weak moments, during our failures, we need to still continue to be strong in the Lord. Amen. So really the question to ask ourselves tonight is this. Do we see ourselves in Gideon's weakness? But do we also see ourselves being willing to serve? I think we all have weaknesses. But does that mean that now we should just do nothing? I don't think so. That's not what God wants us to do. Nothing? I don't think so. Our example is to be like Gideon. He obeyed God by giving all of his attention to the task at hand that he was committed to. And if each and every one of us give our full attention to believing God, it will prepare us for tomorrow when it comes. Why? Because God is with us. God is with us. All we have to do is worry about today. Tomorrow's going to come. Or he's going to rapture us or we're going to die an earthly death. But tomorrow's going to come. And you know what? The Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he's loving us, loving us and he's with us today, guess what? He'll be with us tomorrow too. Amen? Yes. Amen. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for not only the book of Judges, but for giving us a detailed description of each and every one of them, Lord. Their weaknesses, their strengths, Lord. We see them, we see ourselves in them. And Lord, how you use them for your mighty works. You know, just as in Gideon's case, uh, we ne may never know what would happen if in a certain situation, if we got our way. But this we do know, that God's way is perfect and our way is not. And as Jesus said, not my will, but yours. Lord, I just pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we would take that to heart. That whatever you would have us do, that it be your will and that we would follow it. And we would follow it in obedience and we would follow it with a commitment to honor you. But let me tell you, folks, before you can do any of that, you've got to give your life to Christ. You've got to be truly saved. You've got to be born again. I just ask if there's anybody here tonight or watching that has never given their life to Christ, and I mean really from their heart, not just spoke some words, said a prayer, thought about it in their mind. I'm talking about really accept Christ in your heart. Now's the time to do it. Today is the day of salvation. And if that's you here tonight, I just pray that you would just right now, just all you have to do is just ask God to forgive you of your sins. Just say, God, forgive me of my sins. Lord, help me to repent from my sins. Place your, your faith, your trust, and your belief in the one true God. <coughs> Tell him you want to follow him and mean it. Just ask for forgiveness of your sins and help to repent. If you've done that tonight, I'm here to tell you that you're truly born again. Jesus promises us that he'll never leave you nor will he forsake you and he is with you. Lord, I just ask that if anyone has given their life to you, Lord, I just ask you just to continue to bless them. Put your hand upon them of peace, Lord. 
I ask you to use them for your mighty works and for always for your honor, praise, and glory. So, Lord, bless us as we go about the rest of our week. Let us be very thoughtful of seeing open doors and windows to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. amen.